can hear you, baby. We can certainly hear you. That, my friends, the Scissor Sisters. And yes, it is a disco cover of the Pink Floyd classic, Comfortably Numb. That version was their first top 10 hit. Now, the band, originally from America, started in the New York City gay club disco scene, and they got the disco and the glam and the pop and all that stuff. But it wasn't America that made them stars. No, it was Britain that caught on first. Their debut album sold two and a half million copies on the other side of the pond, making it the best-selling album in the UK of 2004. A year later, that star was still rising. They scored a musical hat trick, three Brit Awards, Best International Group, Best International Breakthrough, and Best International Album. And then, ah, uh, well then things got even better. The band's musical and spiritual godfather, is Elton John, and he's a fan. On their new record called Ta-da, the sisters and Sir Elton John work together on a Don't Feel Like Dancing. Which, interestingly enough, makes everybody feel like dancing. Then they sat back and watched as that track went to numero uno on the UK charts. There you go, a little brief story there on the band. Jake Shears, the man, Scissor Sisters. How are you, sir? Hi, nice to see you, you man. Well. All right. So, even if people, once they hear that, don't feel like dancing, I mean, they know the song, people, they have it. Now, listen, your song is called I Don't Feel Like Dancing, and it makes all of me and my friends want to dance. So I wonder if that means your song, in fact, is a failure. Um, it could, yeah, no, <laughs> it, it could actually be. Isn't that crazy? But you knew it. What's that? You knew it. I mean, you went out and made a song that was so... Can get people moving. I w that, that was that was one moment where we were when we were recording this record. That was like one of the happiest moments I think was 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 writing that song. Is it, are, is it generally a happy band? Um, yeah. But if that was yeah. the, <laughs> if that was the yeah. one that was the one moment when it was happy. This album was like a kidney stone. Now it was like <laughs> it was it was like passing a blockage or oh, something. Why is that? <laughs> um, I, it was just, it was, it was a, I mean, I'm, I, it's, I, I'm happy it exists and everything, but it was, it was kind of a, you know, set, it was a miserable second album experience. What was it, a miserable? Because you came off this monster success. Like, were you surprised at the level of success your band reached? Yeah. yeah, definitely. I mean, you always set goals for yourself and stuff, but you're not like, oh, my, you know, we're, you know, we, we had no idea that it was going to be like that. So, um... So yeah, it was like a it was like a morning after thing. It was like you know this like one night stand, and you're waking up the next morning, and then looking at the person and being like, oh my god, we're stuck with each other for a while. And um, so it's, it was it was intense. It was intense. It was a weird, you know, it was a weird experience. I'm glad it's uh, you know I'm happy it's it's done. But uh, there was joyous moments. Don't get me wrong. Well, when you, when you, when you have a band that has uh, certainly a lot of different people in there and a lot of different personalities, mm. everybody handles success differently. Yes. And how much of the difficulty in the second record was realizing that there are a lot of personalities now who have a lot of ways to handle this? Well, there's. I mean, the the, the band. There are some serious personalities. Everyone in the band is like a serious personality. So it's like we work as this this strange little family, and it's uh it's. I think we do remarkably well for a band with such strong personalities. I mean, like, Anna is like a, you know, a, has an aura that's, that's just huge. Um, you know, and she's a really amazing person. It's, 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 uh, it's, it's definitely an interesting experiment. And then when you walk into the studio to make another record, I suspect that there's actual pressure on you this time that, that wouldn't have been there the first time. Yeah, it's kind of, it's, it's, I was reading this really great uh, interview with Neil Young about the making of Harvest, and, and he said that he was in this place where, he said when you get to a spot where people are expecting you to do the same thing you've already done, it's a really horrible place to be. Um, and I think that that's, that's really true. So that's why it was like, it was a strange record to make. And, and thank God we'll never have to make another second record again. <laughs> you know, I never want to make another second album. But you're going to have to make a third one because this one's doing all right for you. Yes, I'm, I, I'm really excited for us to go in and make a third record. There's, there's a, I mean, we've started writing. Um, we've got a song coming out in a big movie, which I'm really excited about in May. Which movie? I can't say. Oh. You know, I'm not going to, it's one of those things where, like, I won't believe it until I'm sitting in the movie theater and, like, watching it on the screen. Okay, give us a hint. Like, I know they're going to, like, plug in, like, 
you know. Is it like the Fast and the Furious 11? The, yes. <laughs> is that what it is? Yeah, no, it's Fast and Furious 4. Nice. Yeah. That'll be all right. Um, no, but it's really <laughs> exciting. It's exciting. So there's like, there's been a lot of like little pots that our fingers are in and, and stuff, which is exciting. You know, we've all got our own little things going on. Did this band start, I mean, you obviously, you've done a lot of stuff in terms of performing before Scissor Sisters became a household name, but did it start as a reaction to something? You know how there's sometimes a, a certain movement explodes because the music that exists before. Yes. Was it, is it the same for your band? It was. I went to Sonar Festival in Barcelona by myself. I, it might have been 2000. And I went and saw all these bands play. I was watching Fisher Spooner's first European concert. I was watching Chicks on Speed and Miss Kitten and the Hacker. And um, I remember just being so excited by the music I was hearing. And um, I went back to New York and I just kind of realized that if, if if these people were doing it and making music, that's that's what I wanted to do too. So we, so you know, it was it was definitely a reaction to that, which was going on with with um, just dance music and uh, the fact that the Trade Towers came down. I mean, it was uh, we we did our first performance as a band ten days after September 11th. So um, it was really there was just a moment where. There was nothing else to, like, you weren't going to work. <laughs> um, and there was really not much, you know, it was kind of all there was for us to do was to make songs and, and find bar tops to play them on. Did people feel like dancing 10 days after? Like, what was the crowd like? Yes, it was fun. We, the, New York was the, the most, after, this may sound horrible, but after September 11th, it was the most, the year after, uh, after that day was, the most fun I've ever had in New York. Really? It was a free for all. A total relief, I imagine, would say that eventually. It was crazy. It was just like people were having sex and doing drugs and going out. You're telling like, me in New York before 9 11, no one was getting laid or doing drugs? Come not, on. Not, not as much. Not really? as much. Yeah, it was definitely a moment. And they were also being creative. There was this like sudden burst of like creativity where people were just wanting. To, to make things and make songs and uh, perform and have parties and it was wonderful. You know, rock and roll is littered, you know, pop music littered with with stories of you have to go away to break big. North America's mm. fine with your band. You certainly do really well in Canada. Yeah. America's fine, but it's when we were just at the Brit Awards and CBC broadcast the Brit Awards mm. when you guys went on stage. It wasn't the first time, and they had announced the name of the band Scissor Sisters. The place just lost their. It was. So much bigger in, in the UK yeah. than when, I, when I've seen you guys play yeah. here. Well, they knew they were going to see something special. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there was, there was a, we, we set a precedent at the Brits a couple years ago with this performance that we did with Henson. And, um, and that was the last performance that Jim Henson UK, it was the last project they worked on before Brian Henson disbanded their team. You played live. And I know when you watch a lot of award shows, the musicians don't play live. You, mm. weren't, you weren't lip syncing. No. No, you can tell because I'm like, I'm flat the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> you hate watching yourself play, don't I you? hate watching, I can never ever watch myself sing or play. I can't even listen to myself. Like, I won't, like any live recordings or live DVDs or anything, I, I, won't, I make other people approve them, I won't do is, it. Is that just related to the music or is that just sort of born in your personality? Uh, I think it's just, I'm just so self, I'm so critical that I think I, you know, I think I sing horrible. I'm like, oh, what am I doing there? It's, it's just embarrassing. Like, I don't want to. There you go. You know. Nice to see you. Thanks for coming yeah, in, man. Thank you. Everybody, thank Jake, you Scissor me. Sisters. <laughs> thank you. All right, stick around, my friends. Last one to come on the program. We'll be right back.